Whether in the diagnosis of acute ligament instability in the professional athlete or chronic knee pain in the non-athletic patient, accurate diagnosis of problems about the knee depends on a careful physical examination. In this videotape, we will present a thorough, reproducible examination technique which, when combined with an understanding of basic knee anatomy and a familiarity with common knee problems, will result in consistent diagnostic success. Examination begins with a careful history, which when possible emphasizes analysis of the exact mechanism of injury. Information should be retrieved from the player as well as trainers, parents, or anyone else witness to the injury or event. This slow motion replay shows defensive player number 54 sustaining a valgus injury to his left knee, demonstrating the forces involved in his surgically confirmed anterior cruciate and medial collateral ligament injuries. Prompt examination on the field allows for diagnosis prior to onset of swelling and guarding. More commonly, such footage is not available, and diagnosis of a knee complaint begins with a detailed patient history. What was the onset of the symptoms? What is the nature and severity of the pain? Is it dull and aching? Sharp and intermittent? Has there been any associated swelling at the time of the injury or subsequently? Was there a pop at the time of injury, or does the patient feel any clicks? Has the knee rocked, unable to be extended or flexed from a fixed position? Has the knee given way or felt unstable, and if so, doing what? Are the symptoms brought on by any particular activities? What particular things make the symptoms better? This carefully taken history gives the examiner a background against which he may now perform a comprehensive physical examination of the knee, which begins with inspection. This patient should be properly attired to see the entire extremities. Observe how the patient gets on and off the examining table. Notice the overall alignment, looking for evidence of genu verum or valgus. Have the patient walk, inspecting their gait. Is there squinting of the patella or pronation of the feet? Look for a Trendelenburg lurch, recovatum thrust, or a varus moment of the knee. Don't be fooled by static appearances. Only on the weight-bearing view on the right can you appreciate the various deformity in this patient. In the supine position, examine for evidence of asymmetry. Atrophy is detected by first marking a fixed anatomic landmark, here in the medial joint line. Then, measuring from a fixed distance, here 15 centimeters from the medial joint line, the thigh circumference is then measured. Compare this measurement to the opposite normal thigh. The presence of greater than a half centimeter of difference often reflects objective evidence of real underlying knee pathology. Inspect the knee for evidence of abrasion, ecchymosis, erythema, and swelling. With gentle thumb pressure, a fluid wave may be detected by the opposite index finger in patients with a small effusion. In the ballotment test, one hand milks fluid from the suprapatella pouch and the opposite finger presses down on the patella, which springs back in the presence of larger effusions. Palpation is performed in a thorough and systematic manner, beginning with the medial and lateral patella facets, gently displacing them in either direction to more easily access their undersurface. Palpate the patella and its prepatella bursa itself for evidence of swelling, fracture, or contusion. Palpate the quads and the VMO for continuity and tenderness. Feel the inferior pole of the patella. Identify and palpate the lateral collateral ligament, which becomes more prominent in the figure of four position. Palpate the superficial medial collateral ligament along the mid-aspect of the joint line, as well as the tibial and femoral attachments. And palpate the lateral joint line itself, beginning just lateral to the patella tendon, and proceeding stepwise fashion towards the popliteal fossa. Palpate the medial joint line for tenderness as well, from the patella anteriorly to the popliteal fossa posteriorly. Palpate the patella tendon and its tibial insertion for tenderness. Check for tenderness also over the pest tendons 
and its overlying bursa. Range of motion assessment is obtained both actively and passively. Passive measurement is carried out using a goniometer in full extension and in flexion with the patient supine. Compare this motion to the opposite side. Check for the degree of active flexion and active extension. Note any extensor lag having the patient perform a straight leg raise. Loss of extension is better appreciated prone, measuring the difference in heel height in centimeters. Evaluation of the patellofemoral joint begins with measurement of the Q angle, measured by a line drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine to the mid patella, which bisects a second line from the patella to the tibial tubercle. The angle measured should be less than 15 degrees in cases of normal alignment. The apprehension sign is the most common physical diagnostic test for patellofemoral malalignment or instability and involves attempted lateral displacement of the patella. It is important to observe the patient for evidence of apprehension or discomfort during this maneuver. More subtle tests of malalignment include the passive patella glide test, attempting to maximally laterally displace the patella. The ability to displace it laterally greater than 50% of its normal width is indicative of lax medial restraints. The passive patella tilt test attempts to tilt the patella from its lateral side, which if less than 15 degrees indicates tight lateral restraints. Actively look for the J or jump sign as the patella temporarily subluxes or dislocates from its trochlear groove during extension. You have already palpated the facets for tenderness. Check for patellofemoral compression by having the patient perform a straight leg raise while restricting the patella, and feel for crepitus throughout the range of motion. Evaluation of meniscus injuries begins with joint line palpation. Observe the patient for evidence of specific joint line tenderness. The most reliable physical test to detect meniscal pathology is the McMurray test, in which the examiner's fingers are placed along the medial and lateral joint lines. The knee is extended from a fully flexed to a 90 degree flexed position while performing abduction and external rotation and adduction and internal rotation. Palpate for a click along the joint line, indicative of abnormal meniscal mobility. Knee ligament evaluation is performed in each of the most common instability planes. Begin in anterior instability with the Lachman test, the most accurate exam for detecting anterior cruciate ligament or ACL insufficiency. The knee is flexed 15 to 30 degrees and apply an anterior force to the tibia relative to the fixed femur, looking for both the amount of anterior translation and the quality or proprioceptive nature of the endpoint. Remember to examine the opposite knee for comparison of the ligament laxity. In the anterior drawer test, an anterior force is applied to the 90 degree flexed knee, feeling for the degree of anterior translation. This is not as sensitive or reliable as the Lachman test, which under anesthesia is particularly striking. Notice the obliteration of the normal anterior knee contour with its soft endpoint. Anterior lateral rotatory instability also reflects ACL insufficiency and is tested commonly along with the Lachman test. Known as the pivot shift, jerk, or a variety of other names, all are carried out with the examiner grasping the slightly internally rotated foot and while applying a valgus stress, gently flexing and extending the knee, looking for a shift or jerk at 20 to 30 degrees. Under anesthesia, this phenomenon is striking, no longer impeded by pain and guarding frequently present in the awake and acutely injured patient. As the knee flexes beyond 20 to 30 degrees, the anterior laterally sublux tibial plateau reduces. This occurs as the iliotibial band becomes posterior to the axis of the knee, affecting posterior reduction of the plateau in the ACL deficient knee. Posterior instability is much less common and is detected by the sag sign, whereby the tibia sags posteriorly at 90 degrees, losing its normal anterior contour. A posterior drawer test is performed at 90 degrees, attempting to posteriorly translate the tibia. The 
posterior drawer of the internally rotated leg suggests injury to the posterior cruciate ligament, the PCL. Notice in this patient the sag sign of the right knee. With minimal anterior force, the examiner restores the normal anterior contour of the knee. In the quadriceps active test, the knee is flexed between 70 and 90 degrees and the patient tries to slide his foot down the examining table. In so doing, notice the active anterior tibial translation produced by the pull of the quadriceps. With a posteriorly sag tibia, the vector pull of the quadriceps is anterior. Posterior lateral instability is uncommon and best diagnosed by the reverse pivot shift, performed like the regular shift but with the foot externally rotated, the plateau subluxes posterior laterally. A more simple method of detecting posterior lateral instability is by simply noting the degree of tibial external rotation at 30 and 90 degrees. In this 34-year-old injured male, we are testing external rotation at 30 and again at 90 degrees. We first test the normal right side assessing the normal degree of laxity and motion. Measurement of the injured left knee shows increased external rotation at 30 degrees, consistent with posterior lateral rotatory instability. At 90 degrees, additional increased external rotation suggests PCL damage as well. A final test of posterior lateral instability is the varus recurvatum test, so named for the position of the extremity when suspended by the great toe. Medial instability is tested by a valgus stress applied to the 30 degree flexed and fully extended knee. Placing the leg in the axilla frees the examiner's hands to actually palpate the exact amount of joint line opening. Opening at 30 degrees implicates injury to the medial collateral ligament. Opening in extension reflects additional damage to the cruciate ligaments. Lateral instability is performed by applying a varus stress to the fully extended and 30 degree flex knee, noting the degree and end point of joint line opening. At 30 degrees, opening implicates the lateral collateral ligaments, whereas opening in full extension suggests additional significant lateral structure injury. As in any examination, neurovascular assessment is critical particularly in an acute knee injury. Check for pulses, capillary refill, as well as sensory and motor function. And remember, knee pain can be a manifestation of pathology elsewhere, including most commonly the back and the hip. Referred pain from a problem in the hip is common. Examine the hips for symmetry of motion and elicited pain. Remember the hip particularly in the pediatric or adolescent patient with complaints of knee pain. Referral from the back demands inspection of the back for asymmetry, scoliosis, and a complete exam as indicated. Other sources of pain, such as from a leg length discrepancy, must be considered in your overall evaluation. In summary, accurate physical examination of the knee depends on a thorough and systematic approach beginning with a careful history particularly of the acute injury and its mechanism. Inspect the patient looking at alignment, gait, evidence of injury, and swelling. Palpation is performed systematically. Motion is assessed in both active and passive ranges. Evaluate the patellofemoral joint for evidence of pain and malalignment. Meniscal pathology is detected by joint line tenderness or the McMurray, and ligaments are tested for instability in each plane. Always include a neurovascular assessment to be complete and remember to consider referred sources of pain in examination of the knee. When combined with an understanding of basic knee anatomy and familiarity with common knee problems, this systematic approach to the physical examination of the knee will help in the diagnosis and management of the spectrum of patients with problems of the knee.